It is the place we come, Lord, when the world has dragged us down, and Lord, the forgiveness that cleanses us from all unrighteousness can be found because of our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he did on the cross. So Lord, we cast our cares, we cast our burdens, we cast our sins before you, and know, Lord, that uh, you wash us clean. And as far as the east is from the west, you remember our sins no more. Oh, what a glorious day. And so, Father, we thank you. And now, Lord, may your word come alive. And may we cling to it and grow by it. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, 2 Samuel. Oh, chapter 12. We did chapter 11 last week. And I boo-booed, sorry. <laughs> We're allowed to boo-boo. Yes. He forgets Yes. So, 2 Samuel chapter 12, I've entitled our message this evening, Hide and Seek, and you'll see why. Um, David, David should have been at war. <laughs> David should have turned away. Now we're going to see that David shouldn't have tried to hide his sin. Nearly a year has passed, and David may be feeling like he's gotten away with it, but uh, he hasn't. Time has passed, and God is actually, I believe what God's done is given David time to repent on his own. And David writes about this season in Psalm 32, verse 3 through 4, he said this, When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all day. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. And so we're going to see here that David... Um, has spent almost a year thinking he got away with it, but yet his conscience has been eating away at him. And that is because whenever you are a child of God, whenever you are a man or a woman who is a, a man or woman after God's own heart, it's hard to sin and not feel the guilt. Listen, if you're able to sin and you don't feel guilt, I'd be more worried about you than the person who sins and feels that guilt and cannot rest. That's a sign of God's Holy Spirit moving upon your heart. And so here we are, hide and seek. Let's look at manipulation conceived. I'm sorry. We are going to review, gosh, forgive me, we are going to review chapter 11. So back up, Yay. let's look at verse 26. I just want to get us up to speed. It's going to be one of those nights, folks. So let's just, just to rewind and get a little bit of the flavor of what's been going on. Verse 26. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. So she did mourn. She did feel sorry. We recognize that she partook as well. This is Bathsheba. She partook in the sin. We have no record of her saying no. We also know that she's the one that chose to bathe on top of her house on the roof where uh, the castle was overlooking. So no modesty, verse 27. And when her mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David did had not, had, had done, displeased the Lord. So once again, what did he do? He sinned, he killed, and it displeased the Lord. She bore him a son, and everything may seem hunky-dory. As hard as it is sometimes to make things right, when you know you've done wrong, sometimes it's like, but if I make this right, it's going to be, the person's going to do this, the person's going to do that. Listen, as hard as it is to make things right, it's even harder to leave things wrong. And so that's what we're seeing here in David's life. So as we move through 2 Samuel chapter 12, I'm going to break our message into four sections. 
The messenger confronts the malicious conscience, the meaning communicated, and mournful confession. So let's start with verse 1 through 4, the messenger confronts. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David. A year has passed, child is born, and we see here when it said in the last verse that God, and what he had done, displeased the Lord. Obviously, God hasn't forgotten. But notice, it says that God sent Nathan to Israel, to the leadership. No, God sent Nathan to David. God will often come to us one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe God will send someone to talk to you, but God doesn't, listen, God, when you're a child of God, God isn't looking to humiliate you. God is looking to reestablish, reconcile. Sometimes God will send you a message. He'll send you a message through a scripture you read. He'll send you a message through a, a, a pastor's message, or even a hint through a friend that may not even know what's going on. And something they say kind of strikes you like, whoa, that almost sounded like they knew what was going on, but they couldn't possibly know. But sometimes we won't stop and listen. I'm sure, listen, when David says that his bones felt like the drought of summer, obviously it was eating away at him, and yet he did not concede. He did not repent. And so God sent Nathan. Nahum, chapter 3, verse 5. I want you to see this. Nahum, chapter 3, verse 5 says, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will lift up your skirt over your face and will show the nations your nakedness and the kingdoms your shame. What a heavy duty verse. You see, when he's talking to Israel, he's talking to Israel as his bride, as, as, as a woman, the, 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 uh, the body as a whole. He often referred to Israel as his bride. He's saying, listen, my bride, you want to play the harlot? Fine, I will take and pull your skirt up over your head and everyone will see who you are. <laughs> wow. He says the same thing to the church. Folks, just because we are Christians and we have grace and we have mercy doesn't mean that when we sin as Christians that God's going to say, oh, it's okay, you know, it's all right, I forgive you. Listen, there comes a time when you won't repent and you won't deal with it that he will raise your skirt up over your head. Now, guys, you go, well, I don't wear a skirt. What he's saying is he'll bring shame. He'll reveal what you think you're doing in secret. He'll expose it. But that's not what God's heart is. That's not what he wants to do. He would rather for you and I to come humbly, broken, confessing, and getting right with God. And he goes, so Nathan, he sent Nathan. And he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city. One rich and the other poor. So basically he's going to tell him uh, a parable or, or, or a riddle or a story. It's fictitious. It's fictitious in nature, but it's to give a description of what's actually happening. He didn't notice he didn't come up and say, uh, hey, David, God told me what you did. Ooh, ooh. He didn't do that. He comes to me. He says, hey, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask him a question. I'm going to pose a situation before a wise man. There were two men in one city, one rich, one poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished. Now, this story would especially hit David's heart. Why? Well, because remember, David was a shepherd. He was a shepherd. Before he became this king, before he became a warrior, he was a shepherd in the field. In fact, he was such a good shepherd, he took such good care of the sheep that it tells us in 1 Samuel 17, verse 34 through 36, when David was talking to Saul about attacking Goliath for him, uh, David said to Saul, your servant 
used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came to uh, came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, so so let's say a lion, there's a lion, you know, it took a sheep, he'd run after it, hit it, so that he could remove the lamb from his mouth. And then he says this, and when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard. So it's a Duck Dynasty lion. It caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And of course, this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them. So David had an affinity to take care of sheep. He had learned to take care of sheep as if they were his own, even risking his life for his father's herd. Now, notice that uh, Nathan, being sent by, by God, does something very similar to what Jesus does. He teaches in a parable. He uses a parable. Like Jesus would say, say there was a sower going out to sow seed. Or there was this, or there was, he would always talk in parables. One, it was to give the believer a deeper insight, but it was also to veil the truth from the proud. Is it cold? Oh. Oh, okay. I was like, it's not that cold. <laughs> So Jesus would talk in parables. One, if you were a believer, it would give you deeper insight. If you were proud and boastful, it would veil your eyes from being able to know what he was talking about. I like what one person said. The glory of kings is to search out a matter. The glory of the word is to reveal a matter. The glory of God is to conceal the matter. Isn't that interesting? To conceal the matter. So those who are wicked, who had no intention of following God, they don't get it. Don't you see that today? I see that in my own life. Before I was willing to follow God, it made no sense to me. And so in that sense, God conceals his glory from the wicked and from the hard-hearted. And so when someone says, you know, when I witness to them and someone says, I'm not getting it, I don't get it, I recognize this. It's only God who's going to reveal it. Until God reveals it, it's concealed. And he only conceals it against those who are harsh and hard-hearted and prideful. So here, Nathan comes with this parable and he says, hey, there was a rich man and a poor man. One had huge herds and one guy had one little lamb. And it grew up together with him and with his children. And it ate his own food and drank from his cup and laid on his bosom. Basically, this little lamb was like his pet. It was like your favorite puppy, your favorite dog. And it grows up. But it says, it was like a daughter to him. So there was this deep love. He's, Nathan's trying to describe that this wasn't just any lamb. Now, remember that the Holy Spirit is leading. God sent him. This story is about David, Uriah, and Bathsheba. It's not about a rich man and a poor man. This tells us what? This tells us that Uriah deeply loved his wife. That's what Nathan's saying. Listen, this man didn't just have this little lamb. He actually really genuinely loved this lamb. Notice it says it was like a daughter to him. He's not going to say it was like a wife to him because that would be a little creepy. So he uses, he uses an idea to convey a deep intimate love between this man and his sheep like a pet and he says and a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him this wayfaring man this is a picture of sin folks this is a picture of temptation the traveler, it's a traveler who moves around. Do you realize sin never stops looking for a victim? Never does. In fact, Job chapter 1, the very first chapter of Job, verse 7. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? 
So Satan answered the Lord and said, from going to and fro on the earth, from walking back and forth on it. What is Satan doing? He's looking for an opportunity to knock somebody down, to take somebody out. This wayfaring traveler is sin waiting to happen. Because listen, in this story, you're going to see this wayfaring traveler is going to be the temptation for this uh, greedy, selfish man to reveal his heart. Listen, Satan, he doesn't cause you and I to sin. He just stops by and offers you an opportunity. He saw this rich guy with this huge herd. He goes, I know what this guy, I know how to get this guy to trip up. He'll go and take someone else's. He won't give me from his own. He's way too greedy to give from his own. Huh. Satan looks for an opportunity for us to do what we naturally want to do. Satan doesn't have to go, oh, let me see if I can trick Randy in this. No, Satan already knows me. He'll put in front of me what he knows I will go after. And then he waits for a wayfaring man who had come to him. Sin will come to you. It'll come to me. It'll come to us. Guaranteed on a daily basis, there are opportunities for you and I to engage in sin. The question is, are you going to give in to that temptation? So this wayfaring man comes to the rich man. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. That was easy. It was easy. Oh, that wasn't a hard sin. Just for him to go and think, well, gosh, I have a bunch. Well, I'll just take that guy's. It's just a lamb. What's the big deal? I've got so many of them. Well, if it's not such a big deal, why not, <laughs> why not take one of your own? It's especially easy to sin when it doesn't seem to cost us anything at the moment. See, at the moment, oftentimes, sin doesn't seem to have such a great cause. In fact, at the moment that you have this temptation to sin, it seems very easy, very natural. Hey, this is simple. Hey, who's it going to hurt? It ain't so bad. There are people doing way worse things than this. Yeah. But understand this. Sin will always cost someone. And it'll cost you, maybe not today, but eventually. You cannot hide when you seek sin. You cannot hide when you seek sin. We often try and play hide and seek with God. But we cannot do that. Doesn't God see everything? Then why do we act like we can hide things from him? Yet we all do it in one way or another. Now let's look at the malicious conscience in verse 5 through 6. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. Woo! What a righteous guy. He feels for the man's little lamb, for their relationship, for understanding. Man, I would have killed the lion, killed the bear. So kill that man. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Huh. Now, what's interesting, in God's word, there's no death penalty for theft of a sheep or livestock. There's no death penalty for that. There is a death penalty for adultery. There is a death penalty for murder. See, David's committed murder and uh, adultery. Yet this guy steals a sheep and he says, kill him. How appropriate. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. He says he'll he'll die and pay. Well, which in which order? Is he gonna die and then pay fourfold? <laughs> or is he gonna pay fourfold? I don't know. I think he'd have to pay fourfold. Exodus 22 1 says this: if a man steals an ox or a sheep and slaughters it, 
or sells it, he shall restore five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So he's kind of sticking with the law. Well, he can hold the law when it comes to someone else, but he doesn't hold the law when it comes to himself. Do you ever see that? People who can point at other people and tell them exactly whether they're wrong and what the Bible says, but then when they take the word and point it at themselves, they're like, well, it can't be that bad. <laughs> David is executing judgment on himself and doesn't even realize it. David's sin was adultery and murder. Four of David's sons, now get this, David says you'll pay back fourfold. He, that man should surely die and pay back fourfold. The word says if a man steals a sheep, he shall pay back four sheep. Four of David's sons shall die. Huh. Beginning with the child that is conceived through this adulterous affair. Huh. Notice it says David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. Who is the man in this story? David. David. David should be angry with himself. He's done this horrible thing, but he just wants to sweep it under the carpet and pretend like it never happened. Huh. Aren't we quick to judge others? We see their sins, and we're quick to judge, but when we sin... Well, we want to sweep it under the carpet. You know, hey, can't you just forgive me? Well, can it just be okay? Can we just let, you know, let it be bygone. Let's be bygones. Let it, let it go. Hey, I'll take you to lunch. Really? You, well, so what was David's heart against this man who took the lamb? Kill him. Must die. First, he must pay back four times, but then let's kill him. But do you want to hear what David's heart is for himself? Well, Psalm 51 is David writing about this very incident. Now listen. Listen to his judgment on his own heart. Watch. Kill me, O oh God. Kill me today. No, listen to what he says. Have mercy upon me, O oh God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, Blot out my transgressions. Notice he didn't say that for the man who stole the sheep. He didn't say, you know, we should seek the Lord to have mercy. Because God is loving and kind. Then he would blot out his transgression. Oh, he said, kill the man. And he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity. And cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression. Yeah, finally. And my sin is always before me. Look at this. Against you... And only you have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. Quite a difference from as the Lord lives. The man who has done this shall die. Quite a difference from kill the dude to God have mercy, your loving kindness. Matthew chapter 7 Verse 1 through 7 says this. Judge not that you be not judged. Here you go. For with what judgment you judge, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can do you, excuse me. How can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. Hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. So, Nathan has brought this story to David said, David, hey, what do you think about this situation? Perhaps David's even thinking that Nathan's coming to him to uh, tell him this story in order to go, hey, I need a judgment. I'm dealing with this situation. How should I deal with it? And he's like, kill the man, but make him first pay four times. So now that he's made his judgment, now that his heart is all riled, how could someone do that to a poor guy who's got his sheep? I laid my life down for my father's sheep. 
Now Nathan's going to drop the bomb on David. We're going to come to the meaning communicated in verse 7 through 12. David's been hiding, but God is seeking. You can't play hide and seek with God. Verse 7. Then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Dun, dun, dun. Dramatic music there. Can you imagine how David's heart stopped? You ever been driving down the road? And all of a sudden you look in your rearview mirror and those are those magical lights? <laughs> then, then your heart kind of goes into your throat. Yeah. Oh, God. You just kind of clamp up. It's just me. Okay. <laughs> no one ever goes, oh, cop. All right. Hey. <laughs> cool. Cool, man. It's like a disco. No. You get, you get nervous. What is this about? You know? All of a sudden, you're wondering, am I a terrorist? <laughs> is it, do, no, I don't have a body. <laughs> or, or how about this? You ever been leaning back in your chair and you almost fall? Ooh. That must have been the feeling that hit David right then when he said, you are the man. Remember, it's been eating away at him. John says that Nathan says, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel. I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives, plural, into your keeping and gave you a house of Israel and Judah. God, God sends Nathan to say, you're the man who did this horrible thing. How rich were you? I don't know. You're king. You got a mansion. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I've shown you mercy. You have plural wives. And I've shown you mercy in that. And what do you do? You go after some other guy's wife. Wow. What God is saying, not only have I blessed you, I've shown you mercy and grace. And this is how you show your faithfulness back to me. After I bless you, after I do all these things, and if you have, here you go, look at this, look at this. And if that had been too little, I would have given you much more. God saying, bro, God didn't talk like that, I do. God saying, David, I desire to bless you more than what you've received already. Now I have to hold back my hand of blessing. Do you realize that God wants to bless you more, but he holds back his blessings when you engage in sin? When I engage in sin, when we engage in sin, he says, no, I can't bless you. It's like having two kids. You have two kids in the house. One kid cleans his room, does his homework. Yes, dad. Yes, mom. You know, very, you know, oh, I love you. And the other kids, I ain't killing you in my room. I ain't doing nothing. One, you buy a new bike. The other one, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> God is not going to bless your disobedience. Now, he may let you go a little while. David's gone over a year. And God finally says, enough. I've waited for you to repent. Now I'm going to lift your skirt over your head and show the world your nakedness. People, if I were to ask for each one of you to tell me, do you want to be blessed by God? I'm sure nobody here would say they didn't want to be blessed by God. When you and I sin, it hinders our prayers. Give me an example. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. This is speaking, we have this marriage conference coming up. Just to give you an example, here you go. Husbands, likewise, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as a weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of grace of life. Here you go. That your prayers may not be hindered. What is he saying there? God's saying, look, when you're not dealing properly in your marriage, your prayers are hindered. God. I need a new job. I need this. God's saying, 
You need to deal with your wife better. God, I, I, my son or daughter is sick. You need to deal with your husband better. God, this or that. You need to deal with your brother better. I'm not going to answer and bless your prayers until you get your act together. I've already blessed you immensely. You need to repent. You need to make right what you're trying to sweep under the carpet. Listen. What do you have if you have a great big mess? Great big mess. And you take all that mess and you sweep it under the carpet. What do you have? A big a mess. mess under the carpet. <laughs> the mess isn't cleaned up. You have to deal with the mess head on. Yeah, it may be more work. It may be messy at the moment. But you can't play hide and seek with your sin. Shove it under the carpet all you want. God one day is going to lift that carpet up and say, look, not only, not only is it a mess, but now it's rotting and it's stinky and it's worse to clean up. You got to throw out the stuff that was covering. You got to throw out whatever it was on top of. It's eating, eating through your foundation. It's, it's just horrible. Folks, we've got to not play hide and seek. So God says, man, I've done all this stuff. I've blessed you and blessed you. I would have even done more. Verse 9. This is this ouch. Why have you despised the commandments of the Lord to do evil in his sight? <gasps> he was looking when I did that thing? Of course. Is there ever a time that or ever a place that God doesn't see what you and I do? No. My uh, pastor's wife once said this, and, and maybe there's other people who have said it too, but when she said it, it was like, she said in one of her teachings, she said, you know, <laughs> the Holy Spirit will never leave nor forsake us. And sometimes we take him where he doesn't want to go. And we show him things he doesn't want to see because he will never leave nor forsake us. What sin do you drag the Holy Spirit into? Ooh, yikes. To sin, to sin willfully, to sin knowingly, is to despise God. Did you catch that? He said, why have you despised the commandments of the Lord to do the evil in his sight? If you choose to sin, I, I was counseling someone one time, and they simply refused to turn away from their sin. They just they didn't want to do it. And I told them, okay, but here's what you got to do, because they claim to be a, a Christian. I say, you pray? Oh, I pray all the time. Great. Here's what you're going to have to do. If you do not want to give up your sin, next time you pray to God, you need to tell them, you need to tell God, by the way, God, this sin is more important than you are. This sin is more valuable to me than you are. In fact, this sin is really my God. I'm just playing house with you. Wow. The person just looked at me, turned, and went back to their sin. They went back to their God. Hide and seek, folks. Our Christian walk is a game of hide and seek. For most Christians, they seek their sin and they try to hide it. How about we do this? How about we hide ourselves from sin and we seek God? Wouldn't that be better? Yeah. And by the way, you never sin alone. You never sin alone. Why? Well, first of all, you got the Holy Spirit there. Secondly, if it involves someone else, then there's a trio that you're guilty before. It's never a secret sin. We may think it's a secret sin. It ain't a secret. In the secret place, in the secret place of sin, lust grows stronger. Hate and unforgiveness grow stronger. Addiction will grow stronger. And that all happens in the secret sin. You know what I love? I love the flip side of that is true as well. In the secret place, in the secret place of prayer, 
Faith is growing stronger. Integrity is growing stronger. Spiritual strength and, and growth is stronger. Matthew 6.6, 6, here's what it says. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. See, what he says, what God says is, hey, what you do, the sins you do that you think are private, guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to lift your skirt over your head and expose your nakedness to everyone, what you did in the secret place. But on the flip side of that, if your secret place is your time of prayer and seeking him, then openly he's going to reward you with blessings and everyone will see that you have integrity and that you've been praying in the secret place. Either way, your secrets are revealed. Isn't that cool? You get to choose which one is it going to be. Your skirt over your head or blessings upon your head. Well, maybe you're here today and you've been struggling with some secret sin. 1 John 1 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, from all of that secret sin. I like what J. Edward Orr says, if I can get this. There we go. J. Edward Orr says this, to ans the, excuse me, the answer to hidden sin is confession and repentance. To whom should we confess? To whom have we sinned against? If you sin secretly, confess secretly. Admitting publicly that you need the victory, but keeping details to yourself. So what he's saying there, if you sin against someone, then you need to go to that someone. But if your sin is just between you and God, you need to confess that before God, but publicly you have to admit that you have a weakness you can keep the details to yourself. And he goes on and he says, if you sin openly, confess openly. Removing, remove stumbling blocks from those whom you have hindered. If you have sinned spiritually, prayerlessness, uh, lovelessness, unbelief, as well as uh, their uh, offspring, criticism, etc., then confess to the church that you have been a hindrance. So there's different kinds of sin. There's those sins where you're by yourself and it doesn't affect anyone, but it's still sin. Confess that to the Lord and then get help, someone to hold you accountable. If you sin against someone, it is your responsibility, it's your duty. You must go and make things right with them. If you've sinned against the church through maliciousness or prayerlessness or backbiting, then confess to the church and let them hold you accountable. He's right in all those circumstances. He goes on, he says, so God, just in case there's any question that uh, Nathan knows what's going on, he says this, you have killed Uriah the Hittite with a sword. You have taken his, his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. David thought he had hid, hidden his sin and God recounts it to him perfectly through a man who knew nothing about what had transpired. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will rise, uh, excuse me, I will raise up adversaries against you from your own house and I'll take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. Oh, it's worse than that. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of this son. That's you. <laughs> For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. Now, <laughs> this will come to pass. David will be sure that God is punishing him for his sin. His son Absalom 
will rebel and want to be king. He will have sex with one of his father's wives. Actually, he will have he will have sex with one of his father's wives on the rooftop, on the very place where David stood and saw Bathsheba. Now his son Absalom will sleep with one of David's wives. In it on the rooftop, and all of Israel will be able to see them up there doing that deed. Expose it. David was hiding his sin. Absalom, his son, will not hide his sin. In fact, he wants all of Israel to know what he will be seeking as we move in uh, further on in 2 Samuel. Four of his sons will die. All of this because he wasn't satisfied with the blessings that God had already given him. He wanted one more. And it happened to be the wife of one of his loyal, mighty men. And he loved his wife. And David took her anyway. Let's look at the mournful confession in verse 13 through 15. So David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. All sin is against the Lord. Addiction is a re rejection of the Lord. Hatred is a hatred towards the Lord. Unforgiveness is towards the Lord. Backbiting, gossip, greed, all of that, all of sin. All of any sin you or I commit, it may be hurting someone else, it may be against someone else, but know this right here today, the sin you are committing is against God first. Now, you may say, well, yeah, okay, pastor, I committed a sin, but you know, I told God I'm sorry. Okay, that's step one. Yay. But what God wants to see is true repentance, where you go make right the wrong that you have done and the people you have wronged. In this case, he can't. Why? Uriah is dead. Nathan said to David, Paul, the Lord also has put away your sin. You shall not die. Ah, oh, what grace. You see, David decreed that the rich man who stole from the poor man should die. God's word required the penalty for theft. Didn't, excuse me. God's word did not require the penalty for theft, death. But yet that was God, uh, David's judgment for the man who stole the sheep. But God's word did require for murder and adultery. And yet God shows David grace and says, you know what? You shall not die. You are going to suffer the consequences of your own sin, but I'm not going to put you to death. Wow. You realize that's the same for you and I? The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. You and I deserve death. We do, just like David. But in God's mercy, because of what Christ has done, you and I can seek forgiveness and be forgiven. <laughs> but often... We will suffer the consequences of our sin. The seed we sow will grow. If you sow to the spirit, spiritual things. If you sow to the flesh, fleshy things. Now understand, just for David, it took a year to bear the fruit. But the fruit was coming, sure enough. Verse 14. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to the enemy of the Lord to blaspheme. Really? Yeah. Why? Listen, no doubt, no doubt the word is going to get out some way. Remember, Joab, right? Joab knew something was going on because David told Joab directly, hey, you know, go put uh, Uriah in the front line so, and then retreat from him so that he will die. And he does that and he dies and then all of a sudden the next thing you know, wait, wait David married his wife and now has a baby. Hmm, let's do the math. 
boy, that baby came right at night. Wow. Listen. Then the enemies of the Lord, the other nations, they were watching Israel like a hawk. Every time Israel did something, you hear how the Philistines or the Amorites or the Hittites, they knew what was going on. Why? Of course they spy. Nothing's changed, has it? No. <laughs> nation spying on nation. The Lord says, and, and so, oh, by the way, getting back to the point, oftentimes when you and I sin, and then our sin comes out, the unbelievers look at the church and go, really, that's the church of God? That's what Christianity looks like? Well, I don't want to go to, well, look at what's happening in the Catholic church. The John, I don't want to talk about it. But horrible. Just I, I just read about it today, this week. All the, the child abuse is horrible, hundreds. And you know what the unbelieving, they cap us in with them. We're all Christians, just different kinds of churches. The unbelieving world doesn't know the distinction between the two. And the same thing goes for when someone in the, in the uh, Calvary Chapel movement or someone in the Baptist church or someone in the, uh, the Presbyterian. The people just look at it and they say, well, that's all Christianity. That's all Christianum. And it is, if you believe in Jesus Christ. So what he's saying is, look, you cause occasion to the enemies to blaspheme the Lord. When you and I call ourselves Christians and we go to work or we go to the school or we go in our neighborhood and we act worse than the world or just like the world, they're going to look and say, what kind of God is that? However, by this deed, you have given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. The child also who is born to you shall surely die. And Nathan, then Nathan departed to his house. Now, you go, wow, David he did this thing. And all this punishment from God is coming upon his life. Well, don't think that Bathsheba is in the clear either. Why? Well, hey, she gets to be married to a king and live in the palace and everything looks great. No, no. We know this. David has at least eight wives. There's probably more. We only know the names of eight of them. Imagine your reward for sleeping with a guy is you get to be married to him and share him with the eight other beautiful babes that he has. You get to share the chores and raise the kids and maybe, oh, oh, maybe if it's your night, you get a little time with the stud. And that's sad. That's, she had a good man. She had a mighty man. She had a man of integrity. He wouldn't even go and not sleep and sleep in his comfortable bed because of his men, let alone would he cheat on his wife. She had a good man and he loved her. He loved her. And she threw it all away for a few moments of pleasure with the king. Well, now the rest of her life, she gets to share that king with a bunch of other ladies. Wow. And then she watches her son, Solomon, and tries to give him advice and tells him, hey, hey a, a godly woman is more precious than rubies. And he goes, I know, Bob, that's why I got a thousand of them. <laughs> She's probably trying to tell her son, son, if you can find one godly woman, you're set for life. You don't need a thousand women. You just need one precious woman. And then, not only does she share, lose, not only does she lose a mighty man, a strong man, a warrior, a faithful man, a man of integrity, but she will also lose the child that was conceived in this sin. She'll get to see the child. Not a miscarriage. 
to touch her and hold her. And then she leaves her. It's all because of her sin. These two, they're not victims, folks. They're not victims of some ooh, external temptation. No, these two are receiving the reward for the sin that they were seeking. You realize that there's a reward. There's a reward when we seek righteousness. There's an incredible reward. There's also a reward for seeking sin. Either way, you get a reward. One you'll love, one you'll hate. We get to choose. I like what one person said about temptation. Listen to this. But the real strength of temptation often does not lie in the quality of the tempting object, but in the state of the heart and the mind of the one being tempted. What they're saying, folks, is temptation can be something really worthless. We give it worth in our own minds, in our heart. We determine which temptation will be strongest. Some people give in to weak, piddly temptations and they throw their Christian walk out the door. They throw relationships. They throw all that stuff. Some people give strength to really strong temptations that are, do have a powerful grip. You and I get to decide. But you know what is the best defense against temptation? Is to value God greatest of all and not be willing to sin against him. If we hide God's word in our heart, then we will seek his face. But as Christians, that's the only hide and seek we should play. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you that we have a God that is willing to forgive us for our failures, for our weakness. Lord, I thank you that you are willing to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I also know, Lord, that there is fruit for sin. We sow seeds. And so, Lord, I pray for everyone here that we would not just walk out of here convicted, not just walk out of here saying, wow, that message really was something. But we would walk out of here saying, Lord, I want to be right. I do not want to sin against you. I do not want to despise your words. Father, I don't want to make you lift my skirt up over my head in shame. Father, I thank you that you promised us victory when you gave us Jesus. And Father, now I just pray for each one of us that we would evaluate our hearts, evaluate our days, evaluate our nights, evaluate the time that we think we're alone, that we would recognize that we are not alone, that you are there with us, and we would bring you glory and honor, that we would seek you in the secret place. And so, Father, we thank you for this time. I thank you for my brothers and sisters, and Lord, we just love you with all our heart, and we ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, Amen.